Okay, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. It'll get one to you. And uh, see, tonight we're going to we're going to have some corporate prayer. I'm going to make some comments first. <clears throat> we need to have a Bible, though. It's Calvary Chapel. <laughs> you know, it's better grab one. If you don't have it, raise your hand. So I'll make a few comments, and then after that, we'll we'll have corporate prayer, and um, and then we'll we'll dismiss for tonight. It was good to see all of you. As we go into the summer months, isn't that something? 90-something degrees today. I think we'll look back on 2020, and uh, I don't know. You know, 2020, we made history in a lot of ways, I think. Uh, so, but I do think it's been a good year in that, in me talking with people personally one-on-one, I'm hearing that many people are turning closer to the Lord, drawing closer to the Lord, experiencing personal revivals, repenting of sin, seeing some lives changed, and I think that's really good, some homes as well. Um, so just unscripted, I'm not really sure what I want to say, to be honest with you. Um, I wanted to just make some comments tonight about some of the things that we, we see going on in the world. I look at our youth, and I almost feel you know, sorry that the youth have to see images on the TV screen um, the way that that you are seeing them, you know, because um, if it's one thing I think that we were beginning to or, or are enjoying in this country is that the younger generation doesn't, they don't deal with the things that the older generations had to deal with, you know, <laughs> they don't know it. And they are, they're kind of going through life together um, and uh, color and racism is not as much a part of your life as it, it, it was a part of, say, our lives and, and our parents' lives, you know. And, and that's the one thing that I like about the, 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 the generation that, the younger generation, that you all are not, did, are not dealing with that in the same way. And I, I've been questioned. People ask, you know, want to get my comments. Other, other pastors ask me, what, what do I say? And I think it's because I'm African American that they would like to hear my opinion and, you know, what I believe and what I'm seeing is that basically if you look at the video of the murder of George Floyd, then it really doesn't matter what color you are. You're going to have the same level of outrage and disgust for what you're seeing, you know. And I, and I think that um, I think every pastor in America should basically see the video and feel the same way. <laughs> so, um, yes, and I, and, I, and I think that's a... That's a big thing, you know. Um, I think, though, one of the concerns I have is as I look at some of the protests, and I'm, I'm maybe not the most informed because my appetite for the news and the videos, it's, it's, it's not a big appetite, you know. Like, I grow weary of it pretty quick these days. But as I look at the peaceful aspect of it, I'm seeing, again, amongst the young people, I'm seeing um, whites and blacks kids protesting together, um, and I think that's good. But I do think that at the same time, I think what it's turned into, and just stay with me for a moment, is a disgrace to George Floyd and his family. It's a disgrace to the people who want to peacefully protest. I think it's a disgrace to cops that are just disgusted with what they saw, and, and they're, they're just brokenhearted as well. Um, and, and anybody that's broken hearted and because and I'm I'm not really scripted here so I'm probably jumping ahead because I think that what we what was happening is or what could happen and based on what I see is the opportunity especially in the time we live in where everything is videoed now it's an opportunity for some things to be exposed and for our country to deal with them in a healthy way and to see some real real change made and then you have this other stuff happening, and what my heart is is that the eyes of our hearts could be open to reality and truth. I was talking with Pastor Ricky yesterday from the uh, Calvary Chapel Oak City uh, church plant that's in Raleigh, and they're doing a really good ministry there on the street, feeding those who are um, whether homeless or just living in hotels or just in need of some support. Many of you all have given food and clothes and gift cards to be able to help them do that, and, and they really are appreciative of that. And he and I were talking. He's like, you know, Raleigh's doing a protest. Should I go down and participate? 
you know, and if I maybe leave, if it gets violent, I said, man, absolutely. Um, I said, go down. And I said, you know, because those are the people you minister to. But if it turns violent, encourage them to leave. And, you know, but he called me back to kind of tell me what happened. And he said that when he arrived, um, not long after they got there, he and the members of his church, which are black and white people from his church, um, some guys from the group uh, Antifa approached them to recruit them to uh, participate in riots after the protest was over. Um, because it is a group that, um, how many of you have heard of that group? Okay. Now, we don't really know what that group is. I'm not even sure if that group fully understands what they're doing. Because I even think that they're pawns. Um, the Antifa movement in Germany is con composed of multiple, uh, multiple far left autonomous militant groups and individuals who describe themselves as anti fascist according to the Federal Office of Protection of the Constitution and the Federal Agency of Civic Education. Um, the use of the, uh, this particular fascist against uh, opponents of, of uh, the understanding of capitalism, they say, as a form of fascism are central to the movement. In other words, they have a, a form of socialism as their goal uh, in the beginning and in total dominance, um, trying to take away uh, the ability for a country to operate in a healthy way because they like chaos, organized chaos, because it gives opportunity for them to bring about change. Now, in our country, I think that they're trying to accomplish some of the same things. Um, and we have to be wise to this, and there are other groups too, that there's a lot of manipulation behind the scenes that is trying to um, take advantage of this opportunity and literally, I think, rip our country off from something that could have been turn into an opportunity to honor that man and make some change within our country, okay? Um, we understand that this one thing, Jeremiah on the screen, 17, 9, tells us this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Um, and that's all of us because we're born in sin and iniquity. You know, we're, we're not born good. You know, you got you to gotta be weary of people who say, well, you know, Man, man is, is genuinely, people are good. No, genuinely, people are bad. Um, it doesn't take you long as a parent to get over your child's uh, cuteness and realize that they're little tyrants in your house. Um, they are selfish and they want to run everything. And, and we love them because they're these cute little babies. God made them cute so we would tolerate them um, until they get saved. And that's basically the truth. Um, in Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of, the, uh, every intent of, the, um, of his heart was only on evil continually. And, of course, that's when God brought the first judgment into the world. And I think that we're, we're moving in that direction again. And so we have these organized groups that are um, really behind a lot of the bad things that we see going on. And, and, you know, when you think about the origin of racism, um, not only is man's heart wicked, but then on the other side of it, remember that the prince of the power of the air is the one who works in the sons of disobedience, according to Ephesians chapter 2. How many of you have read that before? Okay, so you, you can go read it later. We used to be led by that, according to the lust of our flesh and our minds. And it's when we got saved that we got the Spirit of God within us, which leads us in a different path. But before that, we were wicked within ourselves. You, you know, does that make sense? We understand that. And so I think these are things that we have to think about. You know, what would cause a man to lord over another man in such a way that he would take joy almost in, uh, in having power over him as if the other man is beneath him? Um, that comes and is derived from a very wicked Christless heart, okay? It comes from the pit of hell. We know that Satan comes to both steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus Christ comes that we may have life and that more abundantly. And the scripture that's been echoing in my mind all week is the one where Jesus talks about the two paths. You know, he says there's a broad path that leads to destruction, and many go that way, and then there's a narrow path that leads to life. So as I'm talking tonight, please don't, don't let anything bother you, because I think, I think what I want you to understand is that we have to focus on Christ, 
And we have to always point people to Christ because that's the only solution. We did a shirt one time. I don't know where Pastor Jeffrey went. I see his wife. But we did a shirt one time. It was a missionary shirt where on the back, something to the effect of um, that Jesus is the solution or answer to every problem, you know. And that truly is the reality of it, you know. But, you know, a lot of this stuff, um, you know, has a lot of organization behind it. Um, Margaret Sanger's eugenics project had a racial preoccupation with it. It was on December 10th, 1939, that she wrote to Clarence Gamble. Listen to me very carefully. She explains the nature of her organization's outreach to the African-American community. I only say this because I, I need people to understand that there's always more behind things than we think. You know, people, they want a society fighting against itself. They want organized chaos because that's what Satan desires ultimately, you know. But her outreach to the African-American community, it says, she wrote this, quoting her, the most successful educational approach to the Negro is through the religious appeal. We don't want the, world, the word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. What she was saying is, and she wrote this in her autobiography, what she was saying is that in our process to exterminate the Negro, um, one of the things that we want to do is appeal to the, the black preacher. And in her program, she appealed to black preachers and entertainers to uh, really promote her, her program and to deceive. Part of her program was the, uh, the advocacy of birth control. Um, I won't go through this, but she, she writes, I wish to take advantage of the present opportunity to point out that the unbalance between the birth rate of the unfit and the fit. The unfit means anyone that wasn't considered to be a part of a perfect race idea, okay? So the present opportunity to point out the unbalance between the birth rate of the unfit and the fit Admittedly, the greatest present menace to civilization can never be rectified by the inauguration of a cradle competition between these two classes. In this matter, the, exa the example of the inferior class, the fertility of the feeble-minded, the mentally defective, the poverty-stricken classes should not be held up for immunization to the mentally and physically fit though less fertile presence of the uh, educated and well-to-do classes, and this is a bunch of jargon that she's got here that she was promoting. Um, Singer urge for the sterilization of the unfit and uh, poverty-stricken classes, and of course in California, over 60,000 were sterilized. Even here in North, Carol North Carolina, there was a steriliza sterilization program that was going on in the quiet within the UNC hospitals. Um, and one of the governors of North Carolina, uh, Purdue, made a public apology for those sterilizations. And when I say that, I'm, I'm trying to, I hope you all understand what I mean when I say sterilizations, where when people would go into doctor's offices and hospitals, things were performed on them to prevent them from being able to reproduce against their will and against their knowledge often. Um, and those practices went on. And um, one of the uh, things that she did is she openly uh, apologized. It used to be on YouTube, but you, you can't find it anymore. Um, but that was a public apology that was made at one point. And so what happens is that um, there's been a lot of organized things. Now, I, I get into that for this purpose. I, I don't want to get too far off into that. So then it was in um, the 1900s that Hitler adopted her same teachings when he attempted to exterminate uh, the Jewish race, and he killed millions of Jews. It's an ideology that existed, and it goes way back. And Zechariah talks about the origins of wickedness being the plains of Shinar, from where Nimrod uh, began to conquer men 
and developed cities, Babel and Nineveh. And from there, there was a wickedness and an ideology that persisted through uh, the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. It just kind of continued. Names of the gods would change, but the mentality would stay the same uh, into Persia, into Greece, into the Roman Empire. And what it ultimately is, is a demonic influence behind the scenes, if you will, to control the population of, the, of humanity. And we're moving to, I'm in the book of Revelation on Sunday, so you've been hearing this, we're moving towards a global government uh, of total control. And there's a lot of things that go along in that, and I don't want to spend a lot, of, a lot of time in it. But I think what's happening today, more than ever before, is that people are waking up from that. And people are beginning to understand that there's a lot of demonic things behind the scenes that's going on. And I think that between blacks and whites and Hispanics in the country, that I think that there is a deception. The Bible tells us that a deception is coming, but people are beginning to understand that. And I think for the church, it's time to just kind of understand truth, okay? From a political standpoint, it's time to come out from under that type of influence and worship Jesus and put Jesus first. Um, you know, I'll say this. I'll say a few things. I probably will say more than I should tonight. You know, um, you know, I remember, I remember UNC Hospital trying to force me. They call me on my job every day after my wife and I. It's a, it's a long, so I can't go into this story. Goodness gracious. When uh, our baby, when we were pregnant, and, uh, you know, we didn't really understand uh, a lot of things at the time. We panicked when the UNC doctor told us there may be a problem over an ultrasound that he saw and. And they needed, to do, they needed to do a procedure to tell us the am, amniocentesis or whatever it's called. And, you know, I, to that day, I wish that I had said, no, let's go pray first. We won't do that right now. Because I saw some things in that procedure which really bothered me on the ultrasound. So the baby eventually, um, he eventually passed. But before he did, the weeks leading up to that, you know, he passed probably around 16, 17 weeks. It was the 20th week in before we went into the hospital for them to induce for the baby to come out. But they kept calling me on my job, and they kept telling me that, you know, the, date, the deadline's coming. I'm like, the deadline for what? Bef that we can perform legally an abortion in, in North Carolina. They was trying to push us in that direction, you know. This is just a side note. I'll get back to, the, to something here in a minute. And I had to tell the nurse, I'm like, you know, we're not going to do that. It doesn't matter what happens. You know, they were, they were trying to tell us that he might be born with Down syndrome. And, you know, it's that Margaret Singer mentality that permeates through the medical field to some degree. And I think our, our, we, we have to understand that that's been there and it's been practiced behind the scenes for many, many years. Um, now what's happening, listen to me, now what's happening is for, I think, the African-American community, is that the African American community is waking up, and because you 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 leave you leave uh, segre uh, you leave slavery and then segregation and we go into desegregation, um, and then I think you know the Democratic Party uh, basically uh, put African Americans back into a type of slavery with their social programs and a lot of just bad stuff. You know, you know the government is not going to take care of people. Okay. And I think what's happening now amongst the African-American community is a lot of African-Americans, a lot of us are, are saying that, you know what, you, you can't have our vote for free anymore. you got to do something if you want our vote, you know. Um, and then on top of that, there's a whole group called the Blexit. Anybody know what Blexit means? Well, Blexit is the black exodus of the Democratic Party. Um, now, my wife and I did that 16 years ago, by the way. <laughs> but um, it's just... Because realizing that a lot of what they're doing and what they've done through the years is to manipulate and control people through bad policy, through um, social programs that have destroyed the family. Um, you know, at this point, there's no reason why African Americans should be 13% of the United States population. 13% of the United States, 13% of the United States population. And I got white people having to tell me that when we go to do ministry to try to stop people from having abortions, that 70-something percent of them are white uh, excuse me, are uh, African-American ladies going to have abortions, you know. I'm being educated by white people about what's happening to African-Americans, you know. And, um, and our church is going to be participating in the, the Love Life uh, 
program this year to go out and, and to uh, witness to ladies who are going in for abortions because they don't think they have any other choice because they're, you know, with poverty, having a child is like, you know, what are you going to do? And a lot of people go, uh, not that they want to, and then they hurt because abortion brings pain and shame and hurt for many, many, many years on the women as well as on the young men who are involved in it. And I can say more about that, but I won't right now. So when we begin to think about all of those things, you know, and I know I gave you a lot, and I want you to go do research on everything I said, right? I want you to just go look into that stuff for yourself, okay? Because the main point is when we as Christians begin to look into all of these things, because the question is, is posed, what should a Christian say to someone in regard to what happened to George Floyd? Well, I would say that Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy people. And Jesus Christ came that we may have life and that more abundantly. And life begins when we turn to Jesus. And see, this is the thing. If you're white, you can say that. And if you're black, you can say that. We can all say that. We can all point people to Jesus. Because if the church, I told you this Sunday, right? How many of y'all were here Sunday? I heard the message Sunday. Okay. Yeah, if we, if we give up, if we let the world influence us, if we let the world get us divided, if we let the world and the things that are going on in the world confuse us, if we, even if we get too preoccupied with it, it brings confusion, hurt, pain, uh, all of that stuff. And we have to turn to Jesus, you know? And um, so there's a whole lot of things I could say, uh, which is now is not the time or place. I mean, you've seen that video and you've seen um, the pain that people face and all of that. You know, but we have something special here, and so I think that we want to pray now and spend some time in prayer. I want to remind you of some things, though. I think that, as I was telling you last week on the biblical perspective, what we have to pay attention to through all of these times of difficulty, whether coronavirus or social unrest due to racism um, and murder, is that... You know, when, when, when your leaders are consistently loving you and feeding you the, the word of God and, and standing our ground and putting ourselves on the front lines, I put myself on the front lines in the sense of, and all of the pastors here do, and in, in the sense of if you, you know, they're talking about coronavirus and all this stuff and all, and all this scare and all the, the stuff that they, and then they change their, you know, and yet if you want a hug, um, I'm like, I'm thinking, man, Jesus wouldn't turn away a hug. How can a pastor turn away a hug? I don't care what they say. Like from the beginning, that was how I believed. Jesus, if he was here, which he isn't among us, he wouldn't turn away a hug over coronavirus. <laughs> Jesus touched the leper. And so if I get it, then I'll sit in the house for 14 days and, and eat good and, and pray and read my Bible and get over it and be right back here doing this again. That's the way I, I think it'll go down for me. So I have to I have, to have that mentality to, you know, the Bible says that, you know, having put your hand to the plow, if anyone looks back, he's not worthy of the kingdom. And so this is the thing I was trying to say. You know, there are hirelings. There are people who do this for money. And then there are people who do this because they're called to do this. And so I just want to remind you that anybody that consistently teaches the truth of the Bible, no matter how it's viewed and how people look at them and, and what's going on in the world, when you see that, that's what you need to, to, to pay attention to, okay? That's the example that God has called, God, uh, Paul told Timothy to be an example to the flock. That's the example, you know? And so Jesus told us here, he says, take heed and no one deceive you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. We've seen many do this. There are people alive right now who call themselves Christ. I, look, I challenge y'all to look up the stuff I say. There's a guy named A.E. Miller or A.J. Miller. Uh, he has a partner. She believes she's the reincarnated Mary Magdalene, and he believes he's Jesus. And they live, I think, in Australia. They do seminars, too, in hotels. <laughs> so Jesus says, uh, he says, for many will come in my name saying I'm the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And I've talked about all of this. You can go listen to these teachings, see that you are not troubled. For all these must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows, or these are birth pains. These are, the, you know, of course, Jesus given us a parable 
What's the parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? So what's the parable? The parable is the labor process. Well, how does the labor process go? Well, when a woman gets pregnant um, and as she goes through her terms, her body begins to make changes, right, ladies? <laughs> oh, right, guys? And we'll see. Yeah, we know. We see. Uh, we experience. And those changes intensify the closer she gets to birth. That's why Jesus used this. Jesus says these things will, are the beginnings. These are the beginnings, the birth pains. We're going to see these things. Church, before the rapture, we will see all of these things, and we have seen these things that I just read already, and they are intensifying. How many of you have looked at the earthquake trackers that I put on the Biblical Perspective channel when I did? Okay. There are many of them out there, and you can look at them. They, they track them over 100 years, over the last 50 years, over the last 20 years, over the last 10 years. And you see that intensifying as, as the earth is pulsating, it's, it's groaning, it's getting ready for something. Wars and rumors of wars we've seen, we've heard, even right now, things that are going on in our midst. Um, and then he goes on to say that these are the beginnings of sorrows. Verse 9, I'm in Matthew 24, by the way. I'm sorry. We got to pray. We got 10 minutes. Let me just say a few words and then we're going to pray. Because I want you, I want to be very, very crystal clear, okay? Understand this. I will never tell you it's going to be great. We're going to have our best life now. Uh, you know, if you bought that book, I'm sorry. It's okay. I mean, yeah. Um, I'm not going to tell you. Let me just stay on track. So I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the truth. Here's what Jesus said next. He says, then. As these birthing pains get near towards the end, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, we quickly want to point this to, oh, this must be the Jewish nation because they're always hated. But Jesus is talking to the apostles of the Christian church, and we know that the church as well will be hated. He seems to be hinting towards a persecution that will arise in, against the church, the believers in the end, I believe, as well. We will see persecution begin, I mean, before the rapture. And I think that as Americans, 2020 will teach us that, you know, we can't assume that we're not going to see these things come to our soil anymore. Okay? Verse 10, and then many will be offended that word offended, and it means uh, to place a stumbling block before. Many will be offended. They will, they will stumble and will betray one another. Well, what are they offended by, and why are they betraying one another? Anybody ever wonder what's causing them to be offended, and why all of a sudden are, are, are they betraying one another? And he's talking to the apostles of the Christian church. Well, I believe that as persecution begins, you know, many will be made to stumble by what they begin to see. Many have been made to stumble by the coronavirus. My wife and I, in the middle of the lockdown, we said, man, when we get back to church, there's going to be, we're going to wonder, well, where is so-and-so? And then we'll look and say, well, who are they? You know, <laughs> it'll be a, a change, if you will. Um, you know, it's, it's, let me stay on task. I think what it is is that um, things bring things out of people, you know, and so many would be offended. And when we made the stumble, we betray one another. I can see in the future, you know, we're having a small group meeting uh, or we're meeting with leaders to talk about, okay, what's going to be, you're going to hear me talk about this in the future. Um, what's going to be our underground church protocol? Meaning how do we divide ourselves amongst a bunch of leaders and a bunch of houses spread out around here so that we are not putting the flock at, at, at jeopardy, you know? <laughs> we literally are talking about that now. Um, plan, you know, this is, I like to be, plan, I'm a visionary. I like to say, I don't know what's happening. I like to be able to be ready next time something happens and we can't come here to be able to keep rolling in a certain way, you know? And so we'll betray one another. In other words, you know, turn you in kind of thing for meeting, for worshiping, for following Christ. And we'll hate one another. In verse 11, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because, here's where I wanted to go, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And that's a scary verse because lawlessness abounding, that's kind of what that group that I was talking about earlier, 
uh, that's recruiting people to do uh, riots, you know, they want to bring down the peace and the structure of, of America the way we know it, you know. And when lawlessness abounds, that means that there's so much chaos and so much people turning against each other that people's love begin to grow cold because they don't know who they can trust, you know. And you, we don't want to live in that kind of environment. Now, eventually, rapture's coming. Listen, I'm just, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I'm not trying to scare y'all. I was like, oh, my Lord, Pastor Kevin, I ain't never coming on Wednesday night again. <laughs> but I think that, you know, when Paul in Acts 20 called the Ephesians elders together, he did that to warn them. And I, I think that it's something to be learned for those things, you know, to just say, okay, here's the reality, church, as, as, as time progresses on. Here's the reality. You know, there could come a day where things look very different and how the Christian church meets is more like the first century than it is the 21st century, okay? Uh, when those times come, we need to understand what Scripture is saying. It doesn't mean that Jesus has abandoned us. It means that what Jesus told us we might see before he raptured the church out is what we're seeing. So as mature Christians, we have to be ready for those things. Amen? All right, that's it. That's all I'm going to say. Now, a little moment of corporate prayer before we leave tonight would be really good. Amen? All right. So if you look, we got space now. So if you want to get on your knee, um, if you want to, if you want to just kind of quote a scripture, um, if you want to, if you need to pray with someone in the room because maybe you've offended them and you know you've offended them and you need to get that right, you can do that. But just wherever you are, we're just going to sit, have a moment of prayer. For those of you online, hello, by the way, um, we'll probably check out here in a minute because you won't be able to hear the praying. Um, so sorry about that. Oh, no, no, don't check out. They're going to pass the mic. Okay, good. We're all together now. Uh, one day we'll have it where y'all can call in and we'll, we'll pipe y'all through too. So <laughs> let's pray. Father, I just want to first, uh, Lord, ask you to sort out all the stuff I said in the hearts and minds of the people in the room, Lord. But mature us, Lord. Let us be uh, mature about these things so that we know the truth and that we would be prepared for the things that are coming. And Lord, I, I pray you would hear the hearts of your people now as they lift up their voices to you in Jesus' name. Amen.